Honestly, I have no idea why the Looney Tunes show isn't in the conversation for one of the greatest animated shows of all time. Literally, it gambled on so much and it paid off tenfold. Also, plug in my Reddit. <laughs> Remember, join the reddit, alphaj.show slash reddit, go into the bin comments. So anyway, when we think of the Looney Tunes show, you may think of a completely different set of circumstances for the characters we'd grow up to love, amazing character direction, great art style, plus the show doesn't miss. I've covered about 5-6 to six episodes so far, and it hasn't missed. I've been keeping it pretty Lola themed with my double date review, members only, rebel without a glove review, and I've thrown in some curveballs as well, exploring Daffy Duck through Semper Lie, and Cecil Turtle with customer service. There's still Tina, Porky, Foghorn, and Daffy's relationship, Yosemite, Gossamer, Granny, Tweety and Sylvester, Speedy, Taz, I think you get the point. So if you do like me covering the Looney Tunes show, definitely let me know in the comments here. So within this episode, Eligible Bachelors, we have Porky explain that he's raising money for charity for the good cause of literacy. Nothing says, let's read, like ordering a man to date. But of course, not to be one-upped by Bugs' nonchalant accepting of the offer, Daffy decides to get on his poorly maintained soapbox. Yeah, that literacy, that's my favorite charity. There's too much literacy in the world. We need to fight against literacy. Uh, the uh, Daffy. The fight is for literacy. You know, at least the passion is there. So we get to this event where it's set up where Porky announces someone and they start bidding. They show us this with a random girl making the final bid on some guy. Now I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of Bugs Bunny's attractiveness, but when he's on stage, Porky has not said a word about him. And people bid like their life depended on it. $900. I won him. $1,500. $2,000. $3,000. You better back off. $4,000. I'll fight you for him! Five thousand! Oh, that's it! So let me get this straight. The two humans have a cat fight over the rabbit, and Porky is the one to tell them to stop acting like pigs. That's amazing. Combine that with the more realistic bodies of humans within the show, and I bet this is a bigger challenge to animate. So them getting it correct just makes it seem better than ever. Unfortunately, this fight doesn't get shown beyond that, which is a shame because it was better than whatever was on WrestleMania this year, but rather, we get a new bid, a $100,000 bid, and that new bid is a familiar face. Bun Bun, I'm back. Lola? It's not sold. I'm back in your life. At least for one date, and you can't say no because it's for a good cause. <laughs> Littering! <laughs> What I found funny about the Looney Tunes show that people don't really bring up is that the writers love to mirror jokes between Lola and Daffy, especially to Bugs, almost as if Bugs is the crazy person for thinking differently. A lot of times Daffy and Lola are on the same wavelength about something, even when they don't regularly interact. It almost makes you think about how the two main characters get into relationships in which both dynamics are built around there's a smart one and the not as smart one. However, we get to Daffy, and Porky reads out the cliff notes about Daffy's shortcomings, which he didn't do with Bugs. It's almost as if he didn't want Daffy to get picked. Wouldn't you want to embellish some of his <clears throat> accolades for the sake of getting a good bid? Come on, man, this is for charity. It's actually ironic that what stops people from even considering Daffy at this event is Porky's literacy. Also, look at that face. If anyone gives me that face, I either did something really wrong in public or they're holding in the biggest laugh. Well, we tried. Our internet next special. Too big. <laughs> Sold. Now you may think, huh, Granny, Daffy, that sounds kind of lame. What if I were to tell you that Granny and Daffy actually were the better plot compared to Lola and Bugs in this episode? I promise, I'm not trying to trick you or anything. Of course, the stud, Daffy, shows up to Granny's door looking like he's posing for a 90s rap album. However, it's prefaced with the antics of Tweety and Sylvester, which actually takes a backseat to what Granny and Daffy are about to do. I'm pretty sure I haven't talked about this in any of my other Looney Tunes show reviews, but the paint splatter effect that they have is more than just the intro. It's actually a big part of the aesthetic of the show. Like, look at those clouds. They don't even jump out as odd unless you actually really look at them. So what's the plan? Dinner? Movie? Moonlight stroll on the beach? I thought we'd clean out my attic. Clean your attic? What's romantic about that? 
I'm a 90-year-old woman. Get your mind out of the gutter. So this episode takes a pretty creative turn here, given where we're about to go. They set up the dynamic between Daffy and Granny to be one of a transaction, where both sides are only here to fulfill their side of the deal. Given Daffy's self-centered personality, the episode spares no expense showing you how uninterested and ungrateful he is to be here with Granny. However, let's put a pin in that, because it's going to be important later. Meanwhile, Tweety's trying not to die, and all I'm thinking here is, so let's say Sylvester eats Tweety, did he ever think about the plan after that? He gets dinner in exchange for becoming a rug in Granny's study, because there's no way that he's going to be able to get away with that and not cause suspicion. Anywho, getting around to the beginning of Lola and Bugs' plot, I do want to say that the events here take place after members only, the first Bugs and Lola-centric episode, where towards the end, Bugs and Lola split because Lola was going all out with the wedding despite them knowing each other for a short time. So at this point, Bugs is not completely smitten with Lola. He knows about her, but still largely sees her as a nuisance. Speaking of going all out, Lola plans to take Bugs to Paris, and you gotta hear how Lola breaks it all down. It clearly states in Article 5, Section 3 of the Bachelor Auction Bylaws that the bidder, that's me, will decide where and what constitutes a date while the biddee, that's you, must escort the bidder, again, that's me, on said date for up to but not exceeding 24 hours again, the biddee is you and I'm the bidder. And these are the bylaws. <laughs> Have I said yet that Lola is amazing? Because Lola is amazing. Just the way her dialogue is performed should be studied. It's hard to describe her character in a few words because it seems like she operates off of such a unique perspective. Her scattered brain attitude would be presented at its peak when she talks about doing the crossword puzzle, reading every magazine, peeing four times, eating her peanuts, eating Bugs' peanuts, and the flight didn't even start yet. However, what makes it amazing is like Daffy, it's the passion. The passion in Lola is there and she's unapologetic about it like for example here where bug states that it's going to take 10 hours to get to and from Paris taking up 20 of her contractual 24 hours mm, someone's good at math <laughs> that's what I love about you that and your smile oh and your frown and that in-between smile and frown face. The only thought going through my head as I watch this is that that's your girl, Bugs. It didn't take a miracle for you guys to get together. I mean, look who this man lives with. On a subconscious level, I think Bugs craves that chaotic energy. I honestly think he would be bored out of his mind without Daffy and Lola always bugging him. Now, here's where things kind of get a little shaky. So Bugs turns to another passenger aboard the plane who talks about his noise-canceling headphones. Now, after rudely putting them on mid-conversation, which Bug should have fought him for, I thought that this was going to take the route of Bugs getting noise-canceling headphones or earphones when they reach Paris, thus allowing him to enjoy Lola. However, either my memory is bad, this is the Mandela effect, or they did this in another episode because this point never comes up again. I could have sworn that Bugs did this, and it makes sense within the show because in the beginning it took a lot for him to get used to Lola in order for their relationship to work. So how does Daffy and Granny outcompete Bugs and Lola? Simple. Hubba hubba. How about you set me up on a date with your granddaughter, huh? That's me. I was a spy. <laughs> I kind of share the same sentiment as Daffy here. While Lola and Bugs are going to be hopping around Paris, Granny shares an amazing story about doing an espionage mission during World War II. Sold! I also think the design of young Granny really fits with the atmosphere there. So let's set the scene here. It's the final days of World War II in which Paris is being controlled by Germany. A young Granny is meeting a contact at the Louvre right by the Mona Lisa to get some information. They show you exactly what kind of energy that you're about to get here with another episode having visible guns. We talk about Semper Lie a lot, which again, I've done a video on, given that that was a time in which Daffy joined the army, it would be natural to see guns, but I don't hear this episode brought up enough, and this happened during World War II, in story. I cannot stress that enough. It's actually the second episode to receive a TV PGV rating, after the Foghorn Leghorn story, in which I gotta go back and rewatch because I don't remember anything too bad there. Also, as I'd read straight from the wiki, Granny's World War II flashback may be a homage or reference to the Looney Tunes World War II propaganda cartoons, which mostly featured Daffy Duck or Bugs Bunny as the protagonist of each propaganda short, such as Plain Daffy, Drafty Daffy, Bugs Bunny Nips the Nips, 
Her meets Hair, Scrap Happy Daffy, or Daffy the Commando, as well as Rebel Without Claws, a Civil War themed Looney Tunes cartoon similar in concept to plain Daffy with Tweety in the role of a messenger bird slash carrier pigeon. Getting back to the story, you have a young granny being told that all future messages will be delivered by carrier pigeon at the top of the Eiffel Tower. And what an interesting spot to deliver said messages. Let me go to one of the most notable areas and go to a spot where if I'm caught, I'm done for, and more on that later. Granny would make her way towards the top, seeing that while the Germans had control of France, they don't plan to leave empty handed, taking all of the artwork as well as insult to injury. I love the color palette here, lots of greens, browns, and dull grays very much contrasted against the more saturated colors that you would get in the A-plot. A spy! Get her! Did they catch you? Did they kill you? They killed you, didn't they? And in classic Looney Tunes show fashion, they grab your attention with a really good joke, also letting Daffy get some time to shine, but not a lot to take away from the engaging story, but just enough where he doesn't become an afterthought. Now, if it were any other show, there would be heavy gunfire after they found said spy, but they choose to apprehend, question first, and then kill later, I guess. With an amazing transition between the plots, we start the cycle of Lola not really knowing anything beyond the fact that Paris is the city of love. She gets everything wrong, bugs knows that she gets everything wrong, but her getting everything wrong does not bother her at all, not even in the slightest. In fact, when corrected about things, she just gets excited about the new thing. The Louvre is the most incredible place in the world. The Louvre is an art museum? I thought it was a mall. Oh well, <laughs> when in Rome. <gasps> Wait a second. We're not in Rome. We should go to Rome! Lola is pretty good here. However, she takes the back seat to a better plot. I do want to state that she usually steals the show, but it's hard to follow up an espionage World War II story. So while one easily impressed and one barely impressed bunny sightsee Paris, we get back to the main story. Remember how I said that they chose to apprehend first and shoot later? Well, later happens as they finally realize that they have guns and try to gun down said young granny, who escapes the vicious gunfire to make her way up to the top of the Eiffel Tower. It's here where I'll reiterate, how in the world does she get out of this situation? It's a singular elevator, unless you plan on growing wings. It kind of seems like the person who gave you these instructions is or works for someone who didn't have your best interests in mind. However, nice little twist here. There isn't a carrier pigeon, but a carrier Tweety Bird. You don't look like a carrier pigeon. There's a shortage of pigeons. They're using any belts they can get their hands on. Go. I said to go! Good luck. Now, <laughs> hold up a second. I gotta process everything here. So, in addition to just this being a bad spot to do espionage, they have a shortage of carrier pigeons, yet they have the time to train other animals? I'm assuming that Granny's working for America. There's no way you ran out of pigeons in New York alone. But you get to the penguin after? Like, I need to see the list if the penguin was the next one, because there's a greater war happening behind the scenes if penguins are becoming your new carrier pigeons, but even then, this man forces the penguin to jump to its descent. And yes, we don't hear an impact sound, but I know what a penguin is. That penguin died, and he witnessed and encouraged it. He is massively ugly for even attempting it. They all witness an actual murder and do nothing about it. So after giving the film to Tweety to send to the allied forces, Tweety for some reason develops a bond with Granny after a couple of sentences and a penguin jumping off a ledge, and becomes hesitant to let Granny fight off these gunmen. However, she can handle her own, as these gunmen go back to forgetting that they have guns. With all due respect, Granny should be spawning in heaven right now. Meanwhile, the Eiffel Tower is being slowly lifted by a Zeppelin, although I really should be calling it an airship, because Zeppelins are made by a specific company, but like the Band-Aid and Frisbee, I'm gonna call it what people generally refer to it as. Did you fall? Did you fall to your death? You fell to your death! Oh, it's time for my nap. I'll continue my story when I wake up. 
Oh yeah, she fell to her death. Did Porky mention Daffy's lack of education? As you can tell, they're mirroring the locations that they go to in both plots. At first, Granny spoke about being at the Louvre, and now Bugs and Lola went to the Louvre. They spoke about the Eiffel Tower, and now Bugs and Lola are at the Eiffel Tower. Although this contains one of my favorite jokes within this episode that I don't want to spoil, this is one of the weaker Bugs and Lola plots. It's very good, but when they've been knocking it out of the park every time, a very good is on the lower end of things. So better than most other shows dynamics that are similar, but not the best example that I would show for this show. They go back to Daffy and Granny rather quickly, with Daffy waking up Granny who keeps a golf club at arm's reach just in case anyone sneaks up on her. I found this hilarious given that earlier during the first time that Daffy interrupted her story, she gave him a broom. He should have taken the warning that if anything is within Granny's reach, she will use it on you. Daffy can't take the suspense, and neither can I. Getting back to Daffy, they raise the suspense brilliantly by having her fall off off, which is exactly what should happen given that you went a one-way street here but luckily for some reason again Tweety has a spawn and saves Granny from the fate that the penguin had. We never saw that penguin again by the way. However, after Lola's comments on more aspects of Paris, Bugs has an idea. You need to stop talking. We're in one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Let's take a deep breath, look around, and just take it all in. That's a great- With no talking. It leads into a montage of them spending time within the city, doing a lot of different activities that I'd imagine would go well over the four hour mark, but let's not talk about that. And it is the highlight of this half of the episode. It's not a lot, but it shows you some cute visuals of Bugs and Lola and their journey throughout the finest that Paris can offer. I would imagine that if this was your first viewing of the couple, I wouldn't be mad if you were unimpressed. Unlike the first episode with these two members only, there was a curiosity element to everything there, given that Bugs was slowly learning about Lola's personality and thought that there was some grounding to everything. You also had her parents that played a great role in everything too. Here is sort of a growing pain sort of episode where it was needed, but without knowing about the first episode and the great episodes to come, this can come across as awkward. Like I'm self aware that I'm talking so highly about essentially a couple that is shallow, superficial, and one side literally wants the other side not to talk, but seeing where it went and why this is a continuation of the chaos that happen in members only, it's a needed episode, even if it wasn't noteworthy. Well, besides one thing. Yeah, no, that whole thing would have been a lot more better with talking. Never change, Lola. Another clean transition back into the Granny plot, Tweety takes Granny closer to the Zeppelin, dodging gunfire. However, the genius gunman nearly shoots off his superior's head, and his punishment? Death. I do it myself. <laughs> Yo, Hardscope Harry, take your shot. It's an automatic, just track it. Apparently, he doesn't want to gun down his own ship, even though other people have and should have, and the ship was perfectly fine. In fact, in the scene after this, we would see Tweety set Granny down, and there were airplanes shooting in Tweety's direction, which should have hit the ship. What kind of army is this? They don't want to shoot when they have a clear shot, but when they do shoot, it's at an inopportune time? No wonder they lost the war. So Hardscope Harry has a clear shot on the woman who kicked the guns out of the other gunman's hands. And you'll never guess what happens. He, in many ways, doesn't shoot his shot and ends up having a fist fight with her. They expertly do it, both in the sense of this being intergender combat, but also with this animation style, making it work especially with the tensions and things at stake. And Hardscope Harry gets his gun kicked out of his hand, but through the tussle, flings her to the ledge? Ledge? I don't know what to call this, but let's call this a ledge. However, she's down, but not out. And who are you? Your worst nightmare. <laughs> Oh, so they care about this guy's health, 
the main bad guy can't fall to his doom. Senses are weird. Anywho, this also shows why they would go on to have a lifelong bond, even though it's kind of confusing how it started in the beginning. And it also brings Tweety's age into question, but Sylvester will ask about that later. I do think their sneaking in of CGI towards the end when it came to them turning the Zeppelin around was well implemented. Did it explode into a million pieces? It exploded and killed you, didn't it? You're not very bright, are you? Huh? Over the course of this episode, Daffy went from regretting his decision to being kind of curious, to not being able to bear the suspense long enough to let Granny take a nap, to being fully sold on the story. Admittedly, this is a great story, and the visuals we got to see were beautifully animated, but it allowed for Daffy to be Daffy without being overbearing on the plot, no pun intended. I actually found it to be quite wholesome, especially when you would go on to find out that Granny didn't really want Daffy for anything beyond someone to tell a story to. While it was disguised as cleaning the attic, it turned into something wholesome, a lot better than the trip that Bugs and Lola had. But I'm a hermit, so maybe I'm not the best judge of what determines a better date here. Also, they show that Granny has a legit Eiffel Tower outside her home, despite us never seeing it again. And even within this episode, they make it inconsistent. I think this establishing shot would have been better if they could have avoided introducing dissonance within an episode. Other than that, I wouldn't change a thing about this. This was amazing. After a pretty good Wily and Roadrunner skit, which I'd love to rank from worst to best once I get around to the bulk of these Looney Tunes show episodes, the episode ends with the age-old question, what is Tweety's gender? Apparently, whatever Tweety whispered to Sylvester, he got it wrong. The world may never know. Anywho, that's Eligible Bachelors, a fantastic episode that displays the amazing storytelling abilities and range of the Looney Tunes show. One of my favorite shows of all time, an epic episode. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below or on my subreddit, alphaj.show slash reddit. And until then, thank you so much for your time. Take care. Alpha out.